the Great Jewish Revolt, Siege and Destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70, by Josephus, Part 1. From A.D. 66, events of great moment occurred in Palestine. The Jews were in the throes of revolt against the Roman government. At the same time, the chief factions of the Revolutionary Party were constantly fighting each other. One of these factions was led by the famous John of Giscala, another by Simon Bargioras, and a third by Eleazar. These factions of a party, which, since the reduction of Judea to a Roman province soon after the death of Herod, had resisted the oppression of the procurators, were now stirred to revolt by the exactions of the procurator, Gessius Florus. The revolutionary party, called the Zealots, gained power, and there were many outbreaks in Jerusalem. The counsel of the more prudent spirits was disregarded. At last, Roman blood was shed. The nobility and priesthood played into the hands of the Zealots by applying to Florus to put down the revolt. Florus marched against Jerusalem and was badly beaten by the Zealots. Open war henceforth existed. Josephus, a Jew of the lineage of Aaron, trained according to the best discipline of his race and who had also been well received at Rome, was placed by his countrymen in command of the province of Galilee. Afterward, as a historian, he described the events of the war. Vespasian, who was then Rome's greatest general, soon came at the head of 60,000 Roman soldiers. He attacked Galilee. Josephus, with such followers as he could gather, took position on an almost inaccessible hill in Jotapata which the Romans for five days stormed in vain, then besieged its brave defenders, afterward repeatedly assaulted, and finally, during the night following the 47th day of the siege, Titus, serving under his father Vespasian, gained possession of the place. Josephus, with forty of the principal citizens, hid in a cave, but their refuge was discovered through treachery. Vespasian was anxious to take Josephus alive. He sent the tribune Nicanor, who had been his friend, to the Jewish leader to induce him with fair promises to surrender. Josephus was about to give himself up, but was prevented by his companions. We will care for the honor of our country, they said. At the same time, they offered a sword and a hand that shall use it against thee. Josephus then proposed that they should all die together, but by the hands of one another instead of suicide. Lots were cast. He who drew the first offered his neck to him who stood next, and so forward. Finally, through marvelous fortune, Josephus and one other alone were left, and here the slaughter ended. The two survivors surrendered to the Romans. Loud cries for the death of Josephus arose, but he was spared by the intercession of Titus. The fall of Jotapata led to the subjugation of Galilee. When captured, Josephus made to Vespasian the prophecy, Thou shalt be emperor, thou and thy son after thee, a prediction soon to be fulfilled, for in A.D. 69 Vespasian was proclaimed emperor and the next year went to Rome, leaving Titus to carry on the war and subdue Jerusalem. Vespasian himself, it is recorded, released Josephus, cutting off his chains, thus relieving him from all stain of dishonor. The capture of Jerusalem by Titus in this campaign, says Hosmer, is one of the most memorable events in the history of mankind. It caused the expulsion of an entire race from its home. The Roman valor, skill, and persistence were never more conspicuously displayed. No more desperate resistance was ever opposed to the eagle-emblemed mistress of the ancient world. There is no event of ancient history, the details of which are more minutely known. The circumstances, in all their appalling features, are given to us by the eyewitness Josephus, so that we know them as vividly 
as we do the events of the career of Grant. The legions had orders to encamp at the distance of six furlongs from Jerusalem at the mount called the Mount of Olives, which lies over against the city on the east side and is parted from it by a deep valley interposed between them, which is named Cedron. Now, when hitherto the several parties in the city had been dashing one against another perpetually, this foreign war, now suddenly come upon them after a violent manner, put the first stop to their contentions one against another, and as the seditious now saw with astonishment the Romans pitching three several camps, they began to think of an awkward sort of concord, and said one to another, what do we hear, and what do we mean when we suffer three fortified walls to be built to coop us in, that we shall not be able to breathe freely, while the enemy is securely building a kind of city in opposition to us, and while we sit still within our own walls, and become spectators only of what they are doing, with our hands idle, and our armor laid by, as if they were about somewhat that was for our good and advantage. We are, it seems, so did they cry out, only courageous against ourselves, while the Romans are likely to gain the city without bloodshed by our sedition. Thus did they encourage one another, when they were gotten together, and took their armor immediately, and ran out upon the tenth legion, and fell upon the Romans with great eagerness, and with a prodigious shout, as they were fortifying their camp. These Romans were caught in different parties, and this in order to perform their several works, and on that account had in great measure laid aside their arms, for they thought the Jews would not have ventured to make a sally upon them. And had they been disposed so to do, they supposed their sedition would have distracted them. So they were put into disorder unexpectedly. When some of them left their works, they were about and immediately marched off, while many ran to their arms, but were smitten and slain before they could turn back upon the enemy. The Jews became still more and more in number, as encouraged by the good success of those that first made the attack. And while they had such good fortune, they seemed both to themselves and to the enemy to be many more than they really were. The disorderly way of their fighting at first put the Romans also to a stand who had been constantly used to fight skillfully in good order, and with keeping their ranks and obeying the orders that were given them, for which reason the Romans were caught unexpectedly, and were obliged to give way to the assaults that were made upon them. Now, when these Romans were overtaken and turned back upon the Jews, they put a stop to their career. Yet when they did not take care enough of themselves through the vehemency of their pursuit, they were wounded by them. But as still more and more Jews sallied out of the city, the Romans were at length brought into confusion and put to flight and ran away from their camp. Nay, things looked as though the entire legion would have been in danger unless Titus had been informed of the case they were in and had sent them succors immediately. So he reproached them for their cowardice and brought those back that were running away and fell himself upon the Jews on their flank, with those select troops that were with him, and slew a considerable number, and wounded more of them, and put them all to flight, and made them run away hastily down the valley. Now, as these Jews suffered greatly in the declivity of the valley, so when they were gotten over it, they turned about, and stood over against the Romans, having the valley between them, and there fought with them. Thus did they continue the fight till noon. But when it was already a little after noon, Titus set those that came to the assistance of the Romans with him, and those that belonged to the cohorts, to prevent the Jews from making any more sallies, and then sent the rest of the legion to the upper part of the mountain to fortify their camp. This march of the Romans seemed to the Jews to be a flight, and as the watchman who was placed upon the wall gave a signal by shaking his garment there came out a fresh multitude of jews and that with such mighty violence that one might compare it to the running of the most terrible wild beasts 
To say the truth, none of those that opposed them could sustain the fury with which they made their attacks, but, as if they had been cast out of an engine, they brake the enemy's ranks to pieces, who were put to flight, and ran away to the mountain, none but Titus himself and a few others with him being left in the midst of the acclivity. Now, these others, who were his friends, despised the danger they were in, and were ashamed to leave their general, earnestly exhorting him to give way to these Jews that are fond of dying, and not to run into such dangers before those that ought to stay before him, to consider what his fortune was, and not, by supplying the place of a common soldier, to venture to turn back upon the enemy so suddenly, and this because he was general in the war, and lord of the habitable earth, on whose preservation the public affairs do all depend. These persuasions Titus seemed not so much as to hear, but opposed those that ran upon him, and smote them on the face. And when he had forced them to go back, he slew them. He also fell upon great numbers, as they marched down the hill, and thrust them forward, while those men were so amazed at his courage and his strength, that they could not fly directly to the city, but declined from him on both sides, and pressed after those that fled up the hill, yet did he still fall upon their flank and put a stop to their fury in the meantime a disorder and a terror fell again upon those that were fortifying their camp at the top of the hill upon their seeing those beneath them running away insomuch that the whole legion was dispersed while they thought that the sallies of the jews upon them were plainly insupportable and that titus was himself put to flight because they took it for granted that if he had stayed, the rest would never have fled for it. Thus were they encompassed on every side by a kind of panic fear, and some dispersed themselves one way, and some another, till certain of them saw their general in the very midst of an action, and being under great concern for him, they loudly proclaimed the danger he was in to the entire legion and now shame made them turn back, and they reproached one another that they did worse than run away by deserting Caesar. So they used their utmost force against the Jews, and declining from the straight declivity, they drove them on heaps into the bottom of the valley. Then did the Jews turn about and fight them, but as they were themselves retiring, and now, because the Romans had the advantage of the ground and were above the Jews, they drove them all into the valley. As now the war abroad ceased for a while, the sedition within was revived, and on the feast of unleavened bread, which was now come, it being the fourteenth day of the month Xanthicus, Nisan, when it is believed the Jews were first freed from the Egyptians, Eleazar and his party opened the gates of this inmost court of the temple, and admitted such of the people as were desirous to worship God into it. But John made use of this festival as a cloak for his treacherous designs, and armed the most inconsiderable of his own party, the greater part of whom were not purified, with weapons concealed under their garments, and sent them with great zeal into the temple in order to seize upon it, which armed men, when they were gotten in, threw their garments away, and presently appeared in their armor. Upon which there was a very great disorder and disturbance about the holy house, while the people, who had no concern in the sedition, supposed that this assault was made against all without distinction, as the zealots thought it was made against themselves only. So these left off guarding the gates any longer, and leaped down from their battlements before they came to an engagement, and fled away into the subterranean caverns of the temple, while the people that stood trembling at the altar and about the holy house were rolled on heaps together, and trampled upon, and were beaten both with wooden and with iron weapons without mercy. Such also, as had differences with others, slew many persons that were quiet, out of their own private enmity and hatred, 
as if they were opposite to the seditious, and all those that had formerly offended any of these plotters were now known, and were now led away to the slaughter, and when they had done abundance of horrid mischief to the guiltless, they granted a truce to the guilty, and let those go off that came out of the caverns. These followers of John also did now seize upon this inner temple, and upon all the warlike engines therein, and then ventured to oppose Simon. And thus that sedition, which had been divided into three factions, was now reduced to two. But Titus, intending to pitch his camp nearer to the city than Scopus, placed as many of his choice horsemen and footmen as he thought sufficient opposite to the Jews to prevent their sallying out upon them, while he gave orders for the whole army to level the distance as far as the wall of the city. So they threw down all the hedges and walls which the inhabitants had made about their gardens and groves of trees, and cut down all the fruit trees that lay between them and the wall of the city, and filled up all the hollow places and the chasms, and demolished the rocky precipices with iron instruments, and thereby made all the place level from Scopus to Herod's monuments, which adjoined to the pool called the Serpent's Pool. Now, at this very time, the Jews contrived the following stratagem against the Romans. The bolder sort of the seditious went out at the towers, called the women's towers, as if they had been ejected out of the city by those who were for peace, and rambled about as if they were afraid of being assaulted by the Romans, and were in fear of one another, while those that stood upon the wall, and seemed to be of the people's side, cried out aloud for peace, and entreated they might have security for their lives given them, and called for the Romans, promising to open the gates to them. And as they cried out after that manner, they threw stones at their own people, as though they would drive them away from the gates. These also pretended that they were excluded by force, and that they petitioned those that were within to let them in. And rushing upon the Romans perpetually with violence, they then came back, and seemed to be in great disorder. Now the Roman soldiers thought this cunning stratagem of theirs was to be believed real, and thinking they had the one party under their power and could punish them as they pleased and hoping that the other party would open their gates to them set to the execution of their designs accordingly but for titus himself he had this surprising conduct of the jews in suspicion for whereas he had invited them to come to terms of accommodation by josephus but one day before he could then receive no civil answer from them so he ordered the soldiers to stay where they were. However, some of them that were set in the front of the works prevented him, and catching up their arms, ran to the gates, whereupon those that seemed to have been ejected at the first retired. But as soon as the soldiers were gotten between the towers on each side of the gate, the Jews ran out and encompassed them round, and fell upon them behind while that multitude which stood upon the wall threw a heap of stones and darts of all kinds at them, insomuch that they slew a considerable number, and wounded many more, for it was not easy for the Romans to escape. By reason those behind them pressed them forward, besides which the shame they were under for being mistaken, and the fear they were in of their commanders, engaged them to persevere in their mistake wherefore they fought with their spears a great while, and received many blows from the Jews, though indeed they gave them as many blows again, and at last repelled those that had encompassed them about, while the Jews pursued them as they retired, and followed them, and threw darts at them as far as the monuments of Queen Helena. Now the warlike men that were in the city, and the multitude of the seditious that were with Simon, were ten thousand besides the Idumeans. Those ten thousand had fifty commanders, over whom this Simon was supreme. The Idumeans that paid him homage were five thousand, and had eight commanders, among whom those of greatest fame were Jacob, the son of Sosas, and Simon, the son of Cathlas. 
john who had seized upon the temple had six thousand armed men under twenty commanders the zealots also that had come over to him and left off their opposition were two thousand four hundred and had the same commander that they had formerly eleazar together with simon the son of Arinus. now while these factions fought one against another the people were their prey on both sides and that part of the people who would not join with them in their wicked practices were plundered by both factions simon held the upper city and the great wall as far as cedron and as much of the old wall as bent from siloam to the east and which went down to the palace of monobazus who was king of the adiabeni beyond euphrates he also held that fountain and the acra which was no other than the lower city he also held all that reached to the palace of queen helena the mother of monobazus but john held the temple and the parts thereto adjoining for a great way as also ophla and the valley called the valley of cedron and when the parts that were interposed between their possessions were burned by them they left a space wherein they might fight with each other for this internal sedition did not cease even when the romans were encamped near their very walls but although they had grown wiser at the first onset the romans made upon them this lasted but a while for they returned to their former madness and separated one from another and fought it out and did everything that the besiegers could desire them to do for they never suffered anything that was worse from the romans than they made each other suffer nor was there any misery endured by the city after these men's actions that could be esteemed new but it was most of all unhappy before it was overthrown while those that took it did it a greater kindness for i venture to affirm that the sedition destroyed the city and the romans destroyed the sedition which it was a much harder thing to do than to destroy the walls so that we may justly ascribe our misfortunes to our own people and the just vengeance taken on them to the romans as to which matter let every one determine by the actions on both sides now when affairs within the city were in this posture titus went round the city on the outside with some chosen horsemen and looked about for a proper place where he might make an impression upon the walls but as he was in doubt where he could possibly make an attack on any side for the place was no way accessible where the valleys were and on the other side the first wall appeared too strong to be shaken by the engines he thereupon thought it best to make his assault upon the monument of john the high priest for there it was that the first fortification was lower and the second was not joined to it the builders neglecting to build strong where the new city was not much inhabited here also was an easy passage to the third wall through which he thought to take the upper city and through the tower of antonia the temple itself but at this time as he was going round about the city one of his friends whose name was nicanor was wounded with a dart on his left shoulder as he approached together with josephus too near the wall and attempted to discourse to those that were upon the wall about terms of peace for he was a person known by them on this account it was that caesar as soon as he knew their vehemence that they would not bear even such as approach them to persuade them what tended to their own preservation was provoked to press on the siege he also at the same time gave his soldiers leave to set the suburbs on fire and ordered that they should bring timber together and raise banks against the city and when he had parted his army into three parts in order to set about those works he placed those that shot darts and the archers in the midst of the banks that were then raising before whom he placed those engines that threw javelins and darts and stones that he might prevent the enemy from sallying out upon their works and might hinder those that were upon the wall from being able to obstruct them so the trees were now cut down immediately and the suburbs left naked but now while the timber was being carried to raise the banks and the whole army was earnestly engaged in their works the jews were not however quiet 
and it happened that the people of Jerusalem, who had been hitherto plundered and murdered, were now of good courage, and supposed they should have a breathing time, while the others were very busy in opposing their enemies without the city, and that they should now be avenged on those that had been the authors of their miseries, in case the Romans did but get the victory. However, John stayed behind, out of his fear of Simon, even while his own men were earnest in making a sally upon their enemies without. Yet did not Simon lie still, for he lay near the place of the siege. He brought his engines of war, and disposed of them at due distances upon the wall, both those which they took from Cestius formerly, and those which they got when they seized the garrison that lay in the tower Antonia. But though they had these engines in their possession, they had so little skill in using them that they were in great measure useless to them. But a few there were who had been taught by deserters how to use them, which they did use, though after an awkward manner. So they cast stones and arrows at those that were making the banks. They also ran out upon them by companies and fought with them. Now those that were at work covered themselves with hurdles spread over their banks, and their engines were opposed to them when they made their excursions. The engines, that all the legions had ready prepared for them, were admirably contrived, but still more extraordinary ones belonged to the tenth legion. Those that threw darts and those that threw stones were more forcible and larger than the rest, by which they not only repelled the excursions of the Jews, but drove those away that were upon the walls also. Now the stones that were cast were of the weight of a talent, and were carried two furlongs and farther. The blow they gave was no way to be sustained, not only by those that stood first in the way, but by those that were beyond them for a great space. As for the Jews, they at first watched the coming of the stone, for it was of a white color, and could therefore not only be perceived by the great noise it made, but could be seen also before it came by its brightness. Accordingly, the watchmen that sat upon the towers gave them notice when the engine was let go and the stone came from it, and cried out aloud in their own country language, The sun cometh! So those that were in its way stood off and threw themselves down upon the ground by which means, and by their thus guarding themselves, the stone fell down and did them no harm. But the Romans contrived how to prevent that, by blacking the stone, who then could aim at them with success when the stone was not discerned beforehand as it had been till then, and so they destroyed many of them at one blow. Yet did not the Jews under all this distress permit the Romans to raise their banks in quiet, but they shrewdly and boldly exerted themselves and repelled them both by night and by day. Recording by Linda Johnson The Great Jewish Revolt, Siege and Destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70 by Josephus, Part 2 And now, upon the finishing the Roman works, the workmen measured the distance there was from the wall, and this by lead and a line which they threw to it from their banks, for they could not measure it any otherwise, because the Jews would shoot at them if they came to measure it themselves. And when they found that the engines could reach the wall, they brought them thither. Then did Titus set his engines, at proper distances, so much nearer to the wall that the Jews might not be able to repel them, and gave orders they should go to work. And when, thereupon, a prodigious noise echoed round about from three places, and that, on a sudden, there was a great noise made by the citizens that were within the city, and no less a terror fell upon the seditious themselves. Whereupon both sorts, seeing the common danger they were in, contrived to make a like defense. So those of different factions cried out one to another that they acted entirely as in concert with their enemies, whereas they ought, however, notwithstanding God did not grant them a lasting concord in their present circumstances, 
to lay aside their enmities one against another, and to unite together against the Romans. Accordingly, Simon gave those that came from the temple leave, by proclamation, to go upon the wall. John also himself, though he could not believe Simon was in earnest, gave them the same leave. So on both sides they laid aside their hatred and their peculiar quarrels, and formed themselves into one body. They then ran round the walls, and, having a vast number of torches with them, threw them at the machines, and shot darts perpetually upon those that impelled those engines which battered the wall. Nay, the bolder sort leaped out by troops upon the hurdles that covered the machines, and pulled them to pieces, and fell upon those that belonged to them, and beat them, not so much by any skill they had as principally by the boldness of their attacks. However, Titus himself still sent assistance to those that were the hardest beset, and placed both horsemen and archers on the several sides of the engines, and thereby beat off those that brought the fire to them. He also thereby repelled those that shot stones or darts from the towers, and then set the engines to work in good earnest. Yet did not the wall yield to these blows, excepting where the battering ram of the fifteenth legion moved the corner of a tower, while the wall itself continued unhurt. For the wall was not presently in the same danger with the tower, which was extant far above it. Nor could the fall of that part of the tower easily break down any part of the wall itself together with it. And now the Jews intermitted their sallies for a while, but when they observed the Romans dispersed all abroad at their works, and in their several camps, for they thought the Jews had retired out of weariness and fear, they all at once made a sally at the tower Hippicus, through an obscure gate, and at the same time brought fire to burn the works, and went boldly up to the Romans, and to their very fortifications themselves, where, at the cry they made, those that were near them came presently to their assistance, and those farther off came running after them. And here the boldness of the Jews was too hard for the good order of the Romans, and as they beat those whom they first fell upon, so they pressed upon those that were now gotten together. So this fight about the machines was very hot, while the one side tried hard to set them on fire, and the other side to prevent it. On both sides there was a confused cry made, and many of those in the forefront of the battle were slain. However, the Jews were now too hard for the Romans by the furious assaults they made like madmen, and the fire caught hold of the works, and both all those works and the engines themselves had been in danger of being burned, had not many of those select soldiers that came from Alexandria opposed themselves to prevent it, and, had they not behaved themselves with greater courage than they themselves supposed they could have done, for they outdid those in this fight that had greater reputation than themselves. This was the state of things till Caesar took the stoutest of his horsemen and attacked the enemy, while he himself slew twelve of those that were in the forefront of the Jews, which death of these men, when the rest of the multitude saw, they gave way, and he pursued them, and drove them all into the city, and saved the works from the fire. Now it happened at this fight that a certain Jew was taken alive, who, by Titus's order, was crucified before the wall, to see whether the rest of them would be affrighted and abate of their obstinacy. But after the Jews were retired, John, who was commander of the Idumeans, and was talking to a certain soldier of his acquaintance before the wall, was wounded by a dart shot at him by an Arabian, and died immediately, leaving the greatest lamentation to the Jews, and sorrow to the seditious, for he was a man of great eminence, both for his actions and his conduct also. Now, on the next night, a surprising disturbance fell upon the Romans, for whereas Titus had given orders for the erection of three towers of fifty cubits high, 
that by setting men upon them at every bank he might from thence drive those away who were upon the wall it so happened that one of these towers fell down about midnight and as its fall made a very great noise fear fell upon the army and they supposing that the enemy was coming to attack them ran all to their arms whereupon a disturbance and a tumult arose among the legions and as nobody could tell what had happened they went on after a disconsolate manner and seeing no enemy appear they were afraid one of another and every one demanded of his neighbor the watchword with great earnestness as though the jews had invaded their camp and now were they like people under a panic fear until titus was informed of what had happened and gave orders that all should be acquainted with it and then though with some difficulty they got clear of the disturbance they had been under now these towers were very troublesome to the jews who otherwise opposed the romans very courageously for they shot at them out of their lighter engines from those towers as they did also by those that threw darts and the archers and those that flung stones for neither could the jews reach those that were over them by reason of their height and it was not practicable to take them nor to overturn them they were so heavy nor to set them on fire because they were covered with plates of iron so they retired out of the reach of the darts and did no longer endeavor to hinder the impression of their rams which by continually beating upon the wall did gradually prevail against it so that the wall already gave way to the nico for by that name did the jews themselves call the greatest of their engines because it conquered all things and now they were for a long while grown weary of fighting and of keeping guards and were retired to lodge in the night time at a distance from the wall it was on other accounts also thought by them to be superfluous to guard the wall there being besides that two other fortifications still remaining and they being slothful and their counsels having been ill concerted on all occasions so a great many grew lazy and retired then the romans mounted the breach where nico had made one and all the jews left the guarding that wall and retreated to the second wall so those that had gotten over that wall opened the gates and received all the army within it and thus did the romans get possession of this first wall on the fifteenth day of the siege which was the seventh day of the month artemisius Giar, when they demolished a great part of it as well as they did of the northern parts of the city which had been demolished also by cestius formerly and now titus pitched his camp within the city at that place which was called the camp of the assyrians having seized upon all that lay as far as cedron but took care to be out of the reach of the jews darts he then presently began his attacks upon which the jews divided themselves into several bodies and courageously defended that wall while john and his faction did it from the tower of antonia and from the northern cloister of the temple and fought the romans before the monuments of king alexander and simon's army also took for their share the spot of ground that was near john's monument and fortified it as far as to that gate where water was brought in to the tower hippicus however the jews made violent sallies and that frequently also and in bodies together out of the gates and there fought the romans and when they were pursued all together to the wall they were beaten in those fights as wanting the skill of the romans but when they fought them from the walls they were too hard for them the romans being encouraged by their power joined to their skill as were the jews by their boldness which was nourished by the fear they were in and that hardiness which is natural to our nation under calamities they were also encouraged still by the hope of deliverance as were the romans by their hopes of subduing them in a little time nor did either side grow weary but attacks and fightings upon the wall 
and perpetual sallies out in bodies were there all the day long nor were there any sort of warlike engagements that were not then put in use and the night itself had much ado to part them when they began to fight in the morning nay the night itself was passed without sleep on both sides and was more uneasy than the day to them while the one was afraid lest the wall should be taken and the other lest the jews should make sallies upon their camps both sides also lay in their armor during the night time and thereby were ready at the first appearance of light to go to the battle now among the jews the ambition was who should undergo the first dangers and thereby gratify their commanders above all they had a great veneration and dread of simon and to that degree he was regarded by every one of those that were under him that at his command they were very ready to kill themselves with their own hands what made the romans so courageous was their usual custom of conquering and disuse of being defeated their constant wars and perpetual warlike exercises and the grandeur of their dominion and what was now their chief encouragement titus who was present everywhere with them all for it appeared a terrible thing to grow weary while caesar was there and fought bravely as well as they did was himself at once an eyewitness of such as behaved themselves valiantly and he was to reward them also it was besides esteemed an advantage at present to have any one's valor known by caesar on which account many of them appeared to have more alacrity than strength to answer it and now as the jews were about this time standing in array before the wall and that in a strong body and while both parties were throwing their darts at each other longinus one of the equestrian order leaped out of the army of the romans and leaped into the very midst of the army of the jews and as they dispersed themselves upon this attack he slew two of their men of the greatest courage one of them he struck in his mouth as he was coming to meet him the other was slain by him by that very dart which he drew out of the body of the other with which he ran this man through his side as he was running away from him and when he had done this he first of all ran out of the midst of his enemies to his own side so this man signalized himself for his valor and many there were who were ambitious of gaining the like reputation and now the jews were unconcerned at what they suffered themselves from the romans and were only solicitous about what mischief they could do them and death itself seemed a small matter to them if at the same time they could but kill any one of their enemies but titus took care to secure his own soldiers from harm as well as to have them overcome their enemies he also said that inconsiderate violence was madness and that this alone was the true courage that was joined with good conduct he therefore commanded his men to take care when they fought their enemies that they received no harm from them at the same time and thereby show themselves to be truly valiant men and now titus brought one of his engines to the middle tower of the north part of the wall in which a certain crafty jew whose name was castor lay in ambush with ten others like himself the rest being fled away by reason of the archers these men lay still for a while as in great fear under their breastplates but when the tower was shaken they arose and castor did then stretch out his hand as a petitioner and called for caesar and by his voice moved his compassion and begged of him to have mercy upon them and titus in the innocency of his heart believing him to be in earnest and hoping that the jews did now repent stopped the working of the battering ram and forbade them to shoot at the petitioners and bid castor say what he had a mind to say to him he said that he would come down if he would give him his right hand for his security to which titus replied that he was well pleased with such his agreeable conduct and would be well pleased if all the jews would be of his mind and that he was ready to give the like security to the city now five of the ten dissembled with him and pretended to beg for mercy while the rest 
cried out aloud that they would never be slaves to the Romans, while it was in their power to die in a state of freedom. Now, while these men were quarreling for a long while, the attack was delayed. Castor also sent to Simon, and told him that they might take some time for consultation about what was to be done, because he would elude the power of the Romans for a considerable time. And at the same time that he sent thus to him, he appeared openly to exhort those that were obstinate to accept of Titus's hand for their security. But they seemed very angry at it, and brandished their naked swords upon the breastworks, and struck themselves upon their breast, and fell down as if they had been slain. Hereupon Titus, and those with him, were amazed at the courage of the men, and as they were not able to see exactly what was done, they admired at their great fortitude, and pitied their calamity. During this interval a certain person shot a dart at Castor, and wounded him in his nose, whereupon he presently pulled out the dart, and showed it to Titus, and complained that this was unfair treatment. So Caesar reproved him that shot the dart, and sent Josephus, who then stood by him, to give his right hand to Castor. But Josephus said that he would not go to him, because these pretended petitioners meant nothing that was good. He also restrained those friends of his who were zealous to go to him. But still there was one Aeneas, a deserter, who said he would go to him. Castor also called to them that somebody should come and receive the money which he had with him. This made Aeneas the more earnestly to run to him with his bosom open. Then did Castor take up a great stone and threw it at him, which missed him because he guarded himself against it. But still it wounded another soldier that was coming to him. When Caesar understood that this was a delusion, he perceived that mercy in war is a pernicious thing, because such cunning tricks have less place under the exercise of greater severity. So he caused the engine to work more strongly than before, on account of his anger at the deceit put upon him. But Castor and his companions set the tower on fire when it began to give way, and leaped through the flame into a hidden vault that was under it, which made the Romans further suppose that they were men of great courage, as having cast themselves into the fire. Now Caesar took this wall there on the fifth day after he had taken the first, and when the Jews had fled from him, he entered into it with a thousand armed men, and those of his choice troops, and this at a place where were the merchants of wool, the braziers and the market for cloth, and where the narrow streets led obliquely to the wall. Wherefore, if Titus had either demolished a larger part of the wall immediately, or had come in, and according to the law of war, had laid waste what was left, his victory would not, I suppose, have been mixed with any loss to himself. But now, out of the hope he had that he should make the Jews ashamed of their obstinacy by not being willing, when he was able, to afflict them more than he needed to do, he did not widen the breach of the wall, in order to make a safer retreat upon occasion, for he did not think they would lay snares for him that did them such a kindness. When therefore he came in, he did not permit his soldiers to kill any of those they caught, nor to set fire to their houses neither. Nay, he gave leave to the seditious, if they had a mind, to fight without any harm to the people, and promised to restore the people's effects to them, for he was very desirous to preserve the city for his own sake, and the temple for the sake of the city. As to the people, he had them of a long time ready to comply with his proposals. But as to the fighting men, this humanity of his seemed a mark of his weakness, and they imagined that he made these proposals because he was not able to take the rest of the city. They also threatened death to the people, if they should any one of them say a word about a surrender. They, moreover, cut the throats of such as talked of a peace and then attacked those Romans that were come within the wall. Some of them they met in the narrow streets, and some they fought against from their houses, while they made a sudden sally out at the upper gates, and assaulted such Romans as were beyond the wall, 
till those that guarded the wall were so affrighted that they leaped down from their towers and retired to their several camps upon which a great noise was made by the romans that were within because they were encompassed round on every side by their enemies as also by them that were without because they were in fear for those that were left in the city thus did the jews grow more numerous perpetually and had great advantages over the romans by their full knowledge of those narrow lanes and they wounded a great many of them and fell upon them and drove them out of the city now these romans were at present forced to make the best resistance they could for they were not able in great numbers to get out at the breach in the wall it was so narrow it is also probable that all those that were gotten within had been cut to pieces if titus had not sent them succors for he ordered the archers to stand at the upper ends of these narrow lanes and he stood himself where was the greatest multitude of his enemies and with his darts he put a stop to them as with him did domitius sabinus also a valiant man and one that in this battle appeared so to be thus did caesar continue to shoot darts at the jews continually and to hinder them from coming upon his men and this until all his soldiers had retreated out of the city and thus were the romans driven out after they had possessed themselves of the second wall whereupon the fighting men that were in the city were lifted up in their minds and were elevated upon this their good success and began to think that the romans would never venture to come into the city any more and that if they kept within it themselves they should not be any more conquered for god had blinded their minds for the transgressions they had been guilty of nor could they see how much greater forces the romans had than those that were now expelled no more than they could discern how a famine was creeping upon them for hitherto they had fed themselves out of the public miseries and drank the blood of the city but now poverty had for a long time seized upon the better part and a great many had died already for want of necessaries although the seditious indeed supposed the destruction of the people to be an easement to themselves for they desired that none others might be preserved but such as were against a peace with the romans and were resolved to live in opposition to them and they were pleased when the multitude of those of a contrary opinion were consumed as being then freed from a heavy burden and this was their disposition of mind with regard to those that were within the city while they covered themselves with their armor and prevented the romans when they were trying to get into the city again and made a wall of their own bodies over against that part of the wall that was cast down thus did they valiantly defend themselves for three days but on the fourth day they could not support themselves against the vehement assaults of titus but were compelled by force to fly whither they had fled before so he quietly possessed himself again of that wall and demolished it entirely and when he had put a garrison into the towers that were on the south parts of the city he contrived how he might assault the third wall a resolution was now taken by titus to relax the siege for a little while and to afford the seditious an interval for consideration and to see whether the demolishing of their second wall would not make them a little more compliant or whether they were not somewhat afraid of a famine because the spoils they had gotten by rapine would not be sufficient for them long so he made use of this relaxation in order to compass his own designs accordingly as the usual appointed time when he must distribute subsistence money to the soldiers was now come he gave orders that the commanders should put the army into battle array in the face of the enemy and then give every one of the soldiers his pay the romans spent four days in bringing this subsistence money to the several legions but on the fifth day when no signs of peace appeared to come from the jews titus divided his legions and began to raise banks both at the tower of antonia and at john's monument now his designs were to take the upper city at that monument and the temple at the tower of antonia for if the temple were not taken it would be dangerous to keep the city itself so at each of these parts he raised him banks each legion raising one 
As for those that wrought at John's monument, the Idumeans and those that were in arms with Simon made sallies upon them and put some stop to them, while John's party and the multitude of zealots with them did the like to those that were before the tower of Antonia. These Jews were now too hard for the Romans, not only in direct fighting, because they stood upon the higher ground, but because they had now learned to use their own engines, for their continual use of them one day after another did by degrees improve their skill about them, for of one sort of engines for darts they had three hundred and forty for stones, by the means of which they made it more tedious for the Romans to raise their banks. But then Titus, knowing that the city would be either saved or destroyed for himself, did not only proceed earnestly in the siege, but did not omit to have the Jews exhorted to repentance. So he mixed a good counsel with his works for the siege. And being sensible that exhortations are frequently more effectual than arms, he persuaded them to surrender the city, now in a manner already taken, and thereby to save themselves and sent Josephus to speak to them in their own language, for he imagined they might yield to the persuasion of a countryman of their own. As Josephus was speaking thus with a loud voice, the seditious would neither yield to what he said, nor did they deem it safe for them to alter their conduct. But as for the people, they had a great inclination to desert to the Romans. Accordingly, some of them sold what they had, and even the most precious things that had been laid up as treasures by them for a very small matter, and swallowed down pieces of gold that they might not be found out by the robbers. And when they had escaped to the Romans, went to stool, and had wherewithal to provide plentifully for themselves. For Titus let a great number of them go away into the country whither they pleased. And the main reasons why they were so ready to desert were these, that now they should be freed from those miseries which they had endured in that city, and yet should not be in slavery to the Romans. However, John and Simon, with their factions, did more carefully watch these men's going out than they did the coming in of the Romans. And if anyone did but afford the least shadow of suspicion of such an intention, his throat was cut immediately. But as for the richer sort, it proved all one to them whether they stayed in the city or attempted to get out of it, for they were equally destroyed in both cases, for every such person was put to death under this pretense that they were going to desert, but in reality that the robbers might get what they had. The madness of the seditious did also increase together with their famine, and both those miseries were every day inflamed more and more, for there was no corn which anywhere appeared publicly, but the robbers came running into and searched men's private houses, and then, if they found any, they tormented them, because they had denied they had any. And if they found none, they tormented them worse, because they supposed they had more carefully concealed it. The indication they made use of, whether they had any or not, was taken from the bodies of these miserable wretches, which, if they were in good case, they supposed they were in no want at all of food. But if they were wasted away, they walked off without searching any further. Nor did they think it proper to kill such as these, because they saw they would very soon die of themselves for want of food. Many there were indeed who sold what they had for one measure. It was of wheat, if they were of the richer sort, but of barley, if they were poorer. When these had so done, they shut themselves up in the inmost rooms of their houses, and ate the corn they had gotten. Some did it without grinding it by reason of the extremity of the want they were in, and others baked bread of it, according as necessity and fear dictated to them. A table was nowhere laid for a distinct meal, but they snatched the bread out of the fire, half-baked, and ate it very hastily. The Great Jewish Revolt, Siege and Destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70, by Josephus, Part 3. It was now a miserable case, and a sight that would justly bring tears into our eyes, how men stood as to their food, while the more powerful had more than enough, and the weaker were lamenting for want of it. 
but the famine was too hard for all other passions, and it is destructive to nothing so much as to modesty, for what was otherwise worthy of reverence was, in this case, despised, insomuch that children pulled the very morsels that their fathers were eating out of their very mouths, and what was still more to be pitied, so did the mothers do as to their infants. And when those that were most dear were perishing under their hands, they were not ashamed to take from them the very last drops that might preserve their lives. And while they ate after this manner, yet were they not concealed in so doing. But the seditious everywhere came upon them immediately, and snatched away from them what they had gotten from others. For when they saw any house shut up, this was to them a signal that the people within had gotten some food, whereupon they broke open the doors, and ran in, and took pieces of what they were eating almost up out of their very throats, and this by force. The old men, who held their food fast, were beaten, and if the women hid what they had within their hands, their hair was torn for so doing nor was there any commiseration shown either to the aged or to the infants. But they lifted up children from the ground as they hung upon the morsels they had gotten, and shook them down upon the floor. But still they were more barbarously cruel to those that had prevented their coming in, and had actually swallowed down what they were going to seize upon, as if they had been unjustly defrauded of their right. They also invented terrible methods of torments to discover where any food was, and they were these, to stop up the passages of the privy parts of the miserable wretches, and to drive sharp stakes up their fundament. And a man was forced to bear what it is terrible even to hear, in order to make him confess that he had but one loaf of bread, or that he might discover a handful of barley meal that was concealed, and this was done when these tormentors were not themselves hungry, for the thing had been less barbarous had necessity forced them to it. But this was done to keep their madness in exercise, and as making preparation of provisions for themselves for the following days. These men went also to meet those that had crept out of the city by night, as far as the Roman guards, to gather some plants and herbs that grew wild, and when those people thought they had got clear of the enemy, they snatched from them what they had brought with them, even while they had frequently entreated them, and that by calling upon the tremendous name of God, to give them back some part of what they had brought, though these would not give them the least crumb, and they were to be well contented that they were only spoiled and not slain at the same time. It is impossible to go distinctly over every instance of these men's iniquity, I shall therefore speak my mind here at once briefly, that neither did any other city ever suffer such miseries, nor did any age ever breed a generation more fruitful in wickedness than this was from the beginning of the world. Finally, they brought the Hebrew nation into contempt, that they might themselves appear comparatively less impious with regard to strangers. They confessed what was true, that they were the slaves, the scum and the spurious and abortive offspring of our nation, while they overthrew the city themselves, and forced the Romans, whether they would or no, to gain a melancholy reputation, by acting gloriously against them, and did almost draw that fire upon the temple which they seemed to think came too slowly. And indeed, when they saw that temple burning from the upper city, they were neither troubled at it, nor did they shed any tears on that account while well, yet these passions were discovered among the Romans themselves. So now Titus's banks were advanced a great way, notwithstanding his soldiers had been very much distressed from the wall. He then sent a party of horsemen, and ordered they should lay ambushes for those that went out into the valleys to gather food. Some of these were indeed fighting men, who were not contented with what they got by rapine, but the greater part of them were poor people, who were deterred from deserting by the concern they were under for their own relations, for they could not hope to escape away together with their wives and children without the knowledge of the seditious. Nor could they think of leaving these relations to be slain by the robbers on their account, 
nay the severity of the famine made them bold in thus going out so nothing remained but that when they were concealed from the robbers they should be taken by the enemy and when they were going to be taken they were forced to defend themselves for fear of being punished as after they had fought they thought it too late to make any supplications for mercy so they were first whipped and then tormented with all sorts of tortures before they died and were then crucified before the wall of the city this miserable procedure made titus greatly to pity them while they caught every day five hundred jews nay some days they caught more yet it did not appear to be safe for him to let those that were taken by force go their way and to set a guard over so many he saw would be to make such as guarded them useless to him the main reason why he did not forbid that cruelty was this that he hoped the jews might perhaps yield at that sight out of fear lest they might themselves afterward be liable to the same cruel treatment so the soldiers out of the wrath and hatred they bore the jews nailed those they caught one after one way and another after another to the crosses by way of jest when their multitude was so great that room was wanting for the crosses and crosses wanting for the bodies but so far were the seditious from repenting at this sad sight that on the contrary they made the rest of the multitude believe otherwise for they brought the relations of those that had deserted upon the wall with such of the populace as were very eager to go over upon the security offered them and showed them what miseries those underwent who fled to the romans and told them that those who were caught were supplicants to them and not such as were taken prisoners this sight kept many of those within the city who were so eager to desert till the truth was known yet did some of them run away immediately as unto certain punishment esteeming death from their enemies to be a quiet departure if compared with that by famine so titus commanded that the hands of many of those that were caught should be cut off that they might not be thought deserters and might be credited on account of the calamity they were under and sent them in to john and simon with this exhortation that they would now at length leave off their madness and not force him to destroy the city whereby they would have those advantages of repentance even in their utmost distress that they would preserve their own lives and so find a city of their own and that temple which was there peculiar he then went round about the banks that were cast up and hastened them in order to show that his words should in no long time be followed by his deeds in answer to which the seditious cast reproaches upon caesar himself and upon his father also and cried out with a loud voice that they contemned death and did well in preferring it before slavery that they would do all the mischief to the romans they could while they had breath in them and that for their own city since they were as he said to be destroyed they had no concern about it and that the world itself was a better temple to god than this that yet this temple would be preserved by him that inhabited therein whom they still had for their assistant in this war and did therefore laugh at all his threatenings which would come to nothing because the conclusion of the whole depended upon god only these words were mixed with reproaches and with them they made a mighty clamor in the meantime antiochus epiphanes came to the city having with him a considerable number of other armed men and a band called the macedonian band about him all of the same age tall and just past their childhood armed and instructed after the macedonian manner whence it was that they took that name antiochus with his macedonians made a sudden assault upon the wall and indeed for his own part his strength and skill were so great that he guarded himself from the jewish darts and yet shot his darts at them while yet the young men with him were almost all sorely galled for they had so great a regard to the promises that had been made of their courage that they would needs persevere in their fighting and at length many of them retired but not till they were wounded and then they perceived that true macedonians if they were to be conquerors 
must have Alexander's good fortune also. Now, as the Romans began to raise their banks on the twelfth day of the month Artemisius Giar, so had they much ado to finish them by the twenty-ninth day of the same month, after they had labored hard for seventeen days continually. For there were now four great banks raised, one of which was at the Tower Antonia. This was raised by the fifth legion, over against the middle of that pool which was called Struthius. Another was cast up by the twelfth legion at the distance of about twenty cubits from the other. But the labors of the tenth legion, which lay a great way off these, were on the north quarter, and at the pool called Amygdalon, as was that of the fifteenth legion, about thirty cubits from it, and at the high priest's monument. And now, when the engines were brought, John had from within undermined the space that was over against the tower of Antonia as far as the banks themselves, and had supported the ground over the mine with beams laid across one another, whereby the Roman works stood upon an uncertain foundation. Then did he order such materials to be brought in as were daubed over with pitch and bitumen, and set them on fire and as the cross-beams that supported the banks were burning, the ditch yielded on the sudden, and the banks were shaken down and fell into the ditch with a prodigious noise. Now, at the first, there arose a very thick smoke and dust, as the fire was choked with the fall of the bank, but as the suffocated materials were now gradually consumed, a plain flame break out, on which sudden appearance of the flame a consternation fell upon the Romans, and the shrewdness of the contrivance discouraged them. And indeed, this accident coming upon them at a time when they thought they had already gained their point, cooled their hopes for the time to come. They also thought it would be to no purpose to take the pains to extinguish the fire, since if it were extinguished, the banks were swallowed up already, and become useless to them. Two days after this, Simon and his party made an attempt to destroy the other banks, for the Romans had brought their engines to bear there, and began already to make the wall shake. And here one Tethius of Garces, a city of Galilee, and Megasaurus, one who was derived from some of Queen Mariamne's servants, and with them one from Adiabene, he was the son of Nabateus and called by the name of Shagiras, from the ill fortune he had, the word signifying a lame man, snatched some torches and ran suddenly upon the engines. Nor were there during this war any men that ever sallied out of the city who were their superiors, either in their boldness or in the terror they struck into their enemies. For they ran out upon the Romans, not as if they were enemies, but friends, without fear or delay. Nor did they leave their enemies till they had rushed violently through the midst of them and set their machines on fire. And though they had darts thrown at them on every side, and were on every side assaulted with their enemies' swords, yet did they not withdraw themselves out of the dangers they were in till the fire had caught hold of the instruments. But when the flame went up, the Romans came running from their camp to save their engines. Then did the Jews hinder their suppers from the wall, and fought with those that endeavored to quench the fire, without any regard to the danger their bodies were in. So the Romans pulled the engines out of the fire, while the hurdles that covered them were on fire. But the Jews caught hold of the battering rams through the flame itself, and held them fast, although the iron upon them was become red-hot, and now the fire spread itself from the engines to the banks, and prevented those that came to defend them. And all this while the Romans were encompassed round about with the flame, and, despairing of saving their works from it, they retired to their camp. Then did the Jews become still more and more in number by the coming of those that were within the city to their assistance, and as they were very bold upon the good success they had had, their violent assaults were almost irresistible. Nay, 
they proceeded as far as the fortifications of the enemy's camp and fought with their guards now there stood a body of soldiers in array before that camp which succeeded one another by turns in their armor and as to those the law of the romans was terrible that he who left his post there let the occasion be whatsoever it might be he was to die for it so that body of soldiers preferring rather to die in fighting courageously than as a punishment for their cowardice stood firm and at the necessity these men were in of standing to it many of the others that had run away out of shame turned back again and when they had set the engines against the wall they put the multitude from coming more of them out of the city which they could the more easily do because they had made no provision for preserving or guarding their bodies at this time for the jews fought now hand to hand with all that came in their way and without any caution fell against the points of their enemies spears and attacked them bodies against bodies for they were now too hard for the romans not so much by their other warlike actions as by these courageous assaults they made upon them and the romans gave way more to their boldness than they did to the sense of the harm they had received from them and now titus was come from the tower of antonia whither he was gone to look out for a place for raising other banks and reproached the soldiers greatly for permitting their own walls to be in danger when they had taken the walls of their enemies and sustained the fortune of men besieged while the jews were allowed to sally out against them though they were already in a sort of prison he then went round about the enemy with some chosen troops and fell upon their flank himself so the jews who had been before assaulted in their faces wheeled about to titus and continued the fight the armies also were now mixed one among another and the dust that was raised so far hindered them from seeing one another and the noise that was made so far hindered them from hearing one another that neither side could discern an enemy from a friend however the jews did not flinch though not so much from their real strength as from their despair of deliverance the romans also would not yield by reason of the regard they had to glory and to their reputation in war and because caesar himself went into the danger before them insomuch that i cannot but think the romans would in the conclusion have now taken even the whole multitude of the jews so very angry were they at them had these not prevented the upshot of the battle and retired into the city however seeing the banks of the romans were demolished these romans were very much cast down upon the loss of what had cost them so long pains and this in one hour's time and many indeed despaired of taking the city with their usual engines of war only and now did titus consult with his commanders what was to be done those that were of the warmest tempers thought he should bring the whole army against the city and storm the wall the opinion of titus was that if they aimed at quickness joined with security they must build a wall round about the whole city and he gave orders that the army should be distributed to their several shares of this work titus began the wall from the camp of the assyrians where his own camp was pitched and drew it down to the lower parts of Sinopolis. thence it went along the valley of cedron to the mount of olives it then bent toward the south and encompassed the mountain as far as the rock called peristerion and that other hill which lies next it and is over the valley which reaches to siloam whence it bended again to the west and went down to the valley of the fountain beyond which it went up again at the monument of ananus the high priest and encompassing that mountain where pompey had formerly pitched his camp it returned back to the north side of the city and was carried on as far as a certain village called the house of the arabinthi after which it encompassed herod's monument and there on the east was joined to titus's own camp where it began now the length of this wall was forty furlongs one only abated 
Now at this wall without were erected thirteen places to keep garrison in, whose circumferences, put together, amounted to ten furlongs. The whole was completed in three days, so that what would naturally have required some months was done in so short an interval as is incredible. When Titus had therefore encompassed the city with this wall, and put garrisons into proper places, he went round the wall, at the first watch of the night, and observed how the guard was kept. The second watch he allotted to Alexander. The commanders of legions took the third watch. They also cast lots among themselves who should be upon the watch in the night time, and who should go all night long round the spaces that were interposed between the garrisons. So all hope of escaping was now cut off from the Jews, together with their liberty of going out of the city. Then did the famine widen its progress, and devoured the people by whole houses and families. The upper rooms were full of women and children that were dying by famine, and the lanes of the city were full of the dead bodies of the aged. The children also, and the young men, wandered about the marketplaces like shadows, all swelled with the famine, and fell down dead wheresoever their misery seized them. As for burying them, those that were sick themselves were not able to do it, and those that were hearty and well were deterred from doing it by the great multitude of those dead bodies, and by the uncertainty there was how soon they should die themselves. For many died as they were burying others, and many went to their coffins before that fatal hour was come. Nor was there any lamentations made under these calamities, nor were heard any mournful complaints, but the famine confounded all natural passions, for those who were just going to die looked upon those that were gone to rest before them with dry eyes and open mouths. A deep silence also, and a kind of deadly night, had seized upon the city, while yet the robbers were still more terrible than these miseries were themselves, for they break open those houses which were no other than graves of dead bodies, and plundered them of what they had, and, carrying off the coverings of their bodies, went out laughing, and tried the points of their swords in their dead bodies, and, in order to prove what metal they were made of, they thrust some of those through that still lay alive upon the ground, but for those that entreated them to lend them their right hand and their sword to dispatch them, they were too proud to grant their requests, and left them to be consumed by the famine. Now every one of these died with their eyes fixed upon the temple, and left the seditious alive behind them. Now the seditious at first gave orders that the dead should be buried out of the public treasury, as not enduring the stench of their dead bodies. But afterward, when they could not do that, they had them cast down from the walls into the valleys beneath. However, when Titus, in going his rounds along those valleys, saw them full of dead bodies, and the thick putrefaction running about them, he gave a groan, and spreading out his hands to heaven, called God to witness that this was not his doing, and such was the sad case of the city itself. But the Romans were very joyful, since none of the seditious could now make sallies out of the city, because they were themselves disconsolate, and the famine already touched them also. These Romans, besides, had great plenty of corn and other necessaries out of Syria and out of the neighboring provinces, many of whom would stand near to the wall of the city and show the people what great quantities of provisions they had, and so make the enemy more sensible of their famine, by the great plenty, even to satiety, which they had themselves. <laughs>